I'm not the asshole for wanting a child for your wedding, but still allowing my daughter to be there. My fiance and I are getting married in October, and while getting ready to send our invitations out, my future mother-in-law saw that I had a note stating that no children under 14 are allowed to attend the ceremony and the reception. There is also a note stating that if they need accommodations for a babysitter to let me know because I'm hiring my usual babysitter for my reception and she's able to take on up to about six kids. My mother-in-law asked what I'm going to do about my daughter when I said she's going to be in the ceremony as the flower girl because she is five. And then after the ceremony, she's going to be with her babysitter. My mother-in-law asked if I thought it was going to be unfair and that if I'm absolutely saying no children under 14, then my child who is under 14 shouldn't be allowed to go either. Well, of course, my mother-in-law went to both sides of the family, and I guess that quite a few people are upset that I'm making rules, but not enforcing it on my own child. Am I the asshole? Should I be enforcing the rules with my child? I also feel like it's my wedding, and I feel like my child is well enough behave. Embarrassing story time about how I was catfished for three years. Disclaimer, this is not my story time. It was sent to me on Instagram. I'm a super shy person. I have such a hard time talking to guys. So one day my friend suggested I do online dating. So I went home and I signed up to a bunch of dating apps. This is when I started meeting a bunch of guys online. And it was much easier to speak to them through there than in person. So one day I get a message from this really cute guy. He asked me for my Instagram and we started messaging each other through there. His profile was full of pictures of him traveling with his dog and his family. He had a Range Rover and even said he was a doctor. Like literally my dream man. After a few weeks, I was completely head over heels in love. And he told me he felt the same way. But we had never even had a phone conversation. That's when I asked him if we could talk on the phone. He told me he was in surgeries all day, so he would have to reschedule. I believed it. He then ghosted me for a full week. When he came back, he apologized and said he's been really busy. So I decided to call him. And you won't believe what happened next. Part two is up. Part two of how I got catfished for three years. This Clemens is not my story time. It was sent to me on Instagram. So like I said in part one, he ghosted me for a full week. When he came back, he said he was just busy. So I called him. And a man with a strange accent answered on the other side. He told me that my boyfriend left his phone in the bathroom and that he happened to find it. And I believed it. A few hours later, I get a message from my online boyfriend saying that he's sorry he missed my call. He said he was really busy for the rest of the week so he wouldn't be able to talk on the phone. I was so in love that I just believed everything he said. Which I know is so stupid. After that, we just messaged each other through WhatsApp for months. Then I asked him to send me some pictures. And he basically sent me screenshots of his Instagram pictures. So I asked him to send me a selfie. Obviously, I wasn't suspecting anything, but I just wanted to see his face. So he sent me a really bad quality picture and I couldn't really even make out the face. That's when he said the camera on his phone wasn't working, which is why he sent me screenshots of Instagram. Again, I believed it. A few days later, he asked me for money. And when I asked him why, he said he was short on funds. So I sent him $3,000. Then he sent a really angry message saying I should have sent more. Part three is up. Part three of how I got catfished for three years. Clemens is not my story time. It's sent to me on Instagram. So I sent him $3,000. A few hours later, I get an angry message from him saying that I should have sent more money. He even called me the B word. I was super heartbroken because I couldn't believe he was talking to me like that. So like an idiot, I apologized and sent $2,000 more. So in total, I'd given him $5,000. I asked him again what he needed the money for, and he said that his money was tied up in investments. A few days later, he apologized and told me the money came through. Before I knew it, almost three years had passed. He kept using COVID as an excuse not to be able to travel to see me. And yes, he did ask me for more money, so in total I had sent him about $20,000. A month ago I told him that for my birthday I wanted to go see him. That's when he sent me a message saying that I was too much and he couldn't handle the relationship anymore. I called him again and the same weird voice answered. That's when he told me that he had been lying to me this whole time and he was actually a 70 year old French man. He told me to leave him alone and hung up. I'm totally heartbroken and I have no way of getting that money back. What should I do? I had a falling out with my family, which led me to be homeless. I ended up living in my Subaru Forester with my fiance, who was living with me at my parents' house at the time. We made a bed out of camping pads and sleeping bags along with a ton of blankets. We stored our food and drinks under the rear seats, which kept it from freezing. This all happened in the winter months of Pennsylvania. Most nights, the weather was around 10 to 20 degrees in Fahrenheit. Camping in your car isn't technically legal here, so we had to hide it. I found a clearing in a remote area of the state forest that wasn't used in the winter. There was no winter maintenance, so we would follow our tire tracks the exact same way every night. This let us know we were alone and nobody had been there. Living in your car in the dead of winter is unnerving but also peaceful at the same time. One night we woke up to see footprints in the snow circling our car but they led into the woods and disappeared after that. On colder nights we'd bundle together and use a remote starter to run the car and warm us up. There was a porta potty in walking distance and the nearest gas station for food was 20 minutes away, sometimes longer if there was more than a few inches of snow on the trail. This went on for most of the winter into the spring until I was in an accident. The roads leading to our spot were all two-lane roads with no passing zones. My fiance was following me in her car since the snow was gone and she could make it down the trail now. Someone passed both of us using the oncoming lane while doing double the speed limit. The road was cold and wet, so they lost control. The accident caused a chain reaction in my fiancé's car sliding into mine when I had to slow down to avoid the accident ahead of me. 
The police ended up accusing us of racing with the driver who passed away in the hospital a few days later. Multiple charges were brought up against us and we couldn't afford to lose our driver's licenses over it since we both worked in the automotive industry and it was a requirement. Homeless and living in our cars with little money, we were faced with the choice of losing our licenses for something that we didn't do or hiring a lawyer to prove our innocence. We chose the latter and had to pay a thousand dollars each. The deadline for payment was short and we ended up selling almost all of our possessions that we had left in order to pay it in time. They threatened to drop our case multiple times over it, which only added to the stress. My fiance's car barely survived after being in the body shop for almost three months. My car, which doubled as our home, was totaled. I used the insurance check to finance the car from the dealer that I worked at. I fell behind on the payments because of the lawyer fees and the lack of work in the shop. There wasn't even enough work for everyone to make 20 hours at one point. I left the shop and worked for multiple food and grocery delivery companies to support myself. My car was repossessed and we ended up sharing my fiance's car. Delivering food for multiple companies was barely enough to pay the bills. Food became a once a day luxury most of the time. Sometimes customers wouldn't put the right zip code for their address or take too long to buzz me into their apartment, so I ended up marking the food as delivered and keeping it. This happened once with a lady who put the wrong town and instead of driving over to the next town, I kept it. They got multiple pizzas and sandwiches, which ended up lasting us three days. I'm not proud of it, but my hunger and frustration with my living conditions got the best of me. It was the only time that I ever stole anything in my life. I'm working in a motorsports shop now and doing well with it. I still have debts to pay off, but I'm moving into a trailer with my fiance this fall. This will be our first home together that's truly ours and we're excited for it. I still deliver food, but it always makes its way to the customer now. Oh, 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 oh,